Jews and driving around uh, half a dozen states and emailing people across the country trying to figure out exactly how many of these streets there were, when they were built, and, and whether they still exist. This is kind of uh, what I've come up with so far. Uh, uh, it's, it's rather clear to me that uh, before 1940, uh, what, there was a period of experimentation with the zoning of residential rooms that resulted in the emergence of the bi-nuclear bi houses uh, during the 1940s. During this period, uh, they were uh, exclusively uh, created by architects uh, on the West Coast or in the Northeast or who had uh, very strong connections with uh, architecture schools or practices in those areas. Uh, the next period, the early period of adoption, seems to run from about 1950 to 1953. This is the period into which the Nichols House falls, of course, at, uh, pretty much precisely, and was a period where the house uh, was uh, uh, not very often, the house type was not very often built, and when it was built, uh, it was uh, for uh, quite well-to-do clients. Uh, these were all place custom houses. There was no such thing as a track house or a spec house uh, uh, by nuclear type uh, during this period. But you do begin to see them proliferating in various par uh, parts of the country outside of California and, and Washington and, uh, and the Northeast, New York, Connecticut, Massachusetts. Uh, that period is followed in the mid 50s by a period of popularization uh, where you do begin to see uh, some speculative builders experimenting with the possibilities of, uh, of by nuclear houses. You start to see some more modest examples, um, and you do see them popping up in many more places. They still uh, are, are not by any means common. Uh, uh, they become even more. Uh, frequently seen uh, in the late 50s and early 60s, uh, but uh, less and less in their characteristic H-shape or U-shaped form. Uh, you start to see a lot more experimentation uh, with the bi-nuclear idea, and it becomes, uh, in many cases, so distorted that it's uh, very difficult to see that it's a bi-nuclear house anymore. One, one example is uh, uh, Mr. Alexander's famous round house uh, in Atlanta, uh, which is actually a binuclear house, but it's circular. It becomes very hard to see its binuclear qualities. Uh, finally, uh, by the mid-60s, uh, the binuclear idea was superseded by uh, other ascendant ideas in house design, and it began to uh, fade from view and from consciousness. <coughs> So here we are back at the Nichols House. You can now compare it. I'll show you the slide again uh, so you can uh, uh, fix in your mind uh, how closely it resembles uh, case study house uh, number three, which I believe must have been among the clippings uh, in the file folder that, according to Beverly Nichols, she took to Boyd Fear's office to let him know what she wanted in a house. Uh, the programs in the two houses are remarkably similar. Uh, both houses are for couples with two children of the same gender. Uh, both of them uh, call for uh, the linking of outdoor living spaces with indoor living spaces uh, for the strict separation of daytime and nighttime activities, uh, for a secluded uh, living zone adjacent to a kitchen and also a large uh, workroom that then uh, has easy access to a carport. The programs are really exactly the same. <clears throat> I'm now going to complicate things a little bit <laughs> and suggest that there are actually two kind of overlapping historical paths that led to the middle paths. <clears throat> On the one hand, there is a path that leads, uh, there's the tradition of the uh, binuclear house from the late 40s uh, uh, on to the early 50s to result in the Nichols House's binuclear aspects. There is, however, a separate tradition, which is 
that with the development of a ranch house. This is the grand name of all ranch houses, also by William Worcester uh, from 1927, uh, an example of, of Cliff by Cliff May, which develops Worcester's idea, as you see there in the middle. And this kind of ranch house fan idea, in which the house has all uh, these sort of uh, branching wings that extend uh, far out from the main portion of the house. Uh, this is a ranch house concept that comes from Cliff May. And so I also believe that Cliff May's book on Western ranch houses was also in Beverly Nichols' uh, file folder, uh, if it was not already in the library of uh, Lloyd Greer or Connor Thompson and I think uh, I think Smart Bunch says at least one of those gentlemen owned a copy of the of Sunset West of Ranch House. I would guess, I would guess not. Anyway, uh, the resemblance to uh, the wing-like forms of many of the maze designs is quite striking in the plan of the Nichols house. <coughs> And here you can see, uh, now I, I, I sort of invite you to see the Nichols house, not as a mighty nuclear house, but now as a ranch house. And you can see a ranch house by Lloyd Greer <laughs> here, and compared to a ranch house by uh, Cliff Mack there. The uh, resemblance is especially striking from the back, uh, the area of the outdoor living <laughs> room. What I think is quite interesting at the moment, those, those of you who really follow uh, the goings on in the world of historic preservation know that uh, uh, Georgia is at sort of at the forefront of, of work on documenting uh, uh, the ranch house. Um, and so I think it's, 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 it's rather interesting to see uh, that the Nichols house uh, really brings up the uh, indebtedness of, uh, of the uh, by nuclear idea to uh, the ranch house tradition there. And they're really coming together in this house in a way that I believe is, is, may very well be unique in the country. <clears throat> in addition to its uh, very, uh, it's quite revolutionary aspects, the Nichols House also has some quite local and traditional ones. Um, and here you can see uh, a piece of the house by Lloyd Greer from 1949, and you can see that the RT of that wing has been uh, uh, reutilized almost verbatim uh, in the master bedroom wing of the Nichols house. This is a rather common practice in architectural offices uh, for, among other reasons, it saves money. <clears throat> Other aspects are much more forward-looking, including the open planning of the daughter's room. Uh, it's really kind of two rooms that were uh, uh, utilizable for uh, the time of their early childhood as one a single room. Uh, it's in that guise that you see in a uh, photograph there. Uh, it had a folding partition in the middle. Uh, later, uh, this folding partition was converted to a solid wall. Now we come to one of the parts that I think is perhaps the most, the most fascinating. This is the Broadway chapter. Um, this is the, the question of how, how houses, particularly houses of certain shape or configuration, can support a particular lifestyle. Uh, and in particular, the ideal of uh, living uh, uh, the indoor-outdoor lifestyle that uh, had become widely recognized uh, in the late 1940s as typical California. Uh, these uh, three houses, there are three houses in Macon that uh, would appear uh, to be uh, houses designed very much for that purpose. Um, uh, and why they accumulated in Macon is probably because Bernard Webb had uh, actually worked for a while in Los Angeles for uh, uh, for a firm out there, and seems to have brought back from middle Georgia some of these California design ideals or lifestyle ideals that uh, he uh, picked up. So it's two of these designs from his office, and the third one is, is uh, from Gene Lee Newton, who uh, had connections 
uh, through her education with Harvard. So the source of her information, uh, her uh, enthusiasm for the California uh, lifestyle uh, may have been indirect uh, rather than direct. And here you can see Beverly Nichols in her kitchen and uh, her garden. Uh, as I mentioned, she was one of Mel Basta's uh, very uh, famous horticultural gurus. Uh, she had gorgeous plants uh, everywhere throughout her yard. There you see some of them. And uh, you can see how the house was rather well adapted to her persona, uh, her look, uh, and uh, her ideal of living that casual yet stylish indoor-outdoor lifestyle that was promoted every month in Sunset Magazine. <laughs> that according to Dean Brooks, she just could not live with that. <laughs> and I guess this is the big surprise of the evening. Bell Boston does not just have one by new warehouse, but it has two. <laughs> And they both were intended to support the California lifestyle, which does not seem to be the case with every single white in their house. I have sort of several tried to research the California aspect, the California question, and it's a really a tough nut to crack. But anyway, here we have, thanks to Karen Shapiro, who related to me, uh, her family's experiences of living in this house in the late 1950s, and how they actually did attempt to use the back uh, patio as an outdoor living room despite the naps and despite mosquitoes <laughs> for as long as I could stand it. Uh, this house would, uh, I, I don't know the sort of design, it's not really, um, it's not really a very architecturally distinguished uh, house, but it certainly is a very good example of a house that was built specifically to support a California living <laughs> style. <laughs> Here's a uh, perhaps better known example here in Georgia. This is the E.D. Martin House in Columbus, uh, built by Pension Barnes for, uh, in 1954, with the landscaping actually done by the famous California landscape architect, Thomas Church, uh, who arranged uh, little uh, outdoor uh, adjunct spaces off of nearly all of the, all of the main rooms of the house. Uh, there's also the courtyard in the middle that forms yet another outdoor living space in addition to the ones along the room of the building. <clears throat> and a little further afield, uh, I found this one in Charlotte, North Carolina from about 1958, uh, uh, built by a man whose wife was homesick from California in, an, in a failed attempt to salvage their marriage. <laughs> <laughs> Now I'm going to move on to uh, looking at the Nichols House in this neighborhood, and I'm showing you a map of the area. And uh, I, I want to make it clear that you all know that what you are looking at on the screen right now is a lie. It is an absolute falsehood. This is not what a building site really looks like. Building sites are not flat and dry. <laughs> they are sloping, and they are often wet, and they have all sorts of things on them, like trees. <laughs> And, and perhaps buildings, and uh, they don't really look like this at all. This is an abstraction. But anyway, this does tell you where we are within Valdosta. There's the lot that the Nichols House occupies, and <coughs> you can see just uh, north of that, the neighborhood known as Alden Park, which developed a little bit later than um, uh, Brookwood Park, which was the neighborhood right along Baker. <clears throat> um, when Lloyd Greer received a commission to design the Nichols House, I have there in little red dots for you, um, uh, at that time he had already uh, designed or, or had uh, in the works uh, three other houses in the immediate vicinity. Uh, he also had done uh, already two other houses uh, on the other side uh, of uh, Batesby Road, on the, on the south side of Batesby Road. But the, the, eventually, did three houses on that side, but those are all three gone. Um, 
The earliest of the houses that he did was this one from 1941, uh, the Deadwire House, uh, later occupied by the Paramours, and after that by the Griffins, but then subsequently by George Saliba, so it's had a whole string of distinguished occupants. Um, uh, the second one to appear is the one, the more uh, northerly one, facing Azalea, uh, from, now I have to look at my cheat, I do have a cheat sheet here, 1946, that's what I thought. In 1946, uh, a, a very interesting concrete block house, uh, and uh, finally, from 1950-51, the most westerly of the three uh, houses, um, <clears throat> which, strictly speaking, did not exist. Well, I guess it, it, kind of, it was under construction at the time that Nicholas House was in design. I guess that's how I would say it. Uh, this was a house uh, by, uh, for William Perlman, um, and was another uh, western house of uh, very decidedly uh, modern and California-looking uh, style. And so when Lloyd Greer was out sketching on uh, Beverly Nichols' new lot, uh, as I said, he was not just looking at the trees, but he was also considering the relationship of the, of the house he was going to put on that site to the ones that he had uh, already designed for the two adjacent lots, and also with the knowledge that along Bay Tree, the house was beginning to form a, a line of houses. Um, and so uh, that, those circumstances became decisive elements in his design thinking. And here you have just so you can kind of see how they how they look in real life, so you don't have to just think of them as a map. They're real three-dimensional places. There you have them. This, this one, the, the uh, Deadflower House, I, I think was very likely in, influenced by um, uh, uh, some of uh, this May's work. But it, it's very hard to prove. Um, Eventually, uh, Greer's firm, or its successor firm, because after Greer died in 1952, Connor Thompson took over the firm um, <coughs> and carried it on. And it was in, in, its, in, in that phase of the firm's history, when Connor Thompson was in charge, that the firm designed the Sydney Perlman House. Here, uh, at that time, uh, you can see the development uh, of this uh, corner uh, became complete uh, as a series of uh, four houses on the north side of Bay Tree, all from the office of Lloyd Greer or his successor, and they were flanked by then three houses on the south side of, uh, of, of Bay Tree, also from the firm of Lloyd Greer. Uh, this would have been then a, a quite remarkable collection of uh, rear buildings all very close to each other. <clears throat> uh, here I had attempted to show you uh, my reconstruction of Rear's idea. This is an idea that he carried out not only here, but in fact uh, throughout Valdosta in all of the uh, projects, to my knowledge, that he worked on. He was an architect who was very keen to maintain continuity of the streetscape and therefore, he was uh, uh, careful to align the sods uh, with the street, um, <clears throat> even though he might vary the depth of the sod uh, uh, in some cases. Um, you can see from this map that the shape of the lot um, and also the relationship of the Naples House to its neighbors uh, made the design of that particular house a special challenge. Here I've tried to sketch in the idea of how when you go down the street, uh, seeing at an oblique angle the sides of the house, which are then always perpendicular to the street, 
Uh, even in the case of the oddly configured nickel house, the size of perpendicular to the street, the size of quotation marks on the back of the minute, uh, they create a certain kind of rhythm as you see these houses one after another as you go up the street. You get a kind of rhythm. So this kind of neighborhood design only works if you are conceiving the buildings that go into that neighborhood as having very definite fronts, backs, and sides or profiles. So the ordinary building that would go into a traditional neighborhood of this type has to be a building that has a front and a back and some sides. The architecture that I've been describing is the kind of architecture that is typically created uh, by a community because lots of different members of the community have to agree that, that this is the way to build a neighborhood and also uh, for the community because that community is going to live there. Okay? It, it can only work if everybody involved has some understanding of the established pattern and a respect for that pattern. What's interesting in the case of the Nichols House and, uh, is that from time to time, there are very good reasons that there must be exceptions to the pattern. Exceptions generated, for example, by oddly shaped lots or by, uh, the, well, that's one example, or by uh, uh, unexpected relationships between uh, uh, buildings or views. Um, <clears throat> the exceptions then have to be designed and positioned with special care. Otherwise, the neighborhood begins to fall apart. Uh, if we look at this sort of more general view of the neighborhood, it kind of falls back and looks uh, not just at the corner of the Daly and Bay Tree, but a larger chunk of nearby Valdosta, you can see that in this part of the city, there are actually kind of two grid systems that overlap each other. The, uh, what you might, one of the, one of the systems is the system of, of dwellings, and this system is uh, respected not only by single family dwellings, but in fact by multifamily dwellings as well, which you might be able to see there. Uh, the dwellings uh, all align according, according to one system, and the more monumental buildings down here and then at the top, the more monumental buildings uh, uh, position themselves uh, at uh, angles to uh, many of the uh, uh, <coughs> smaller buildings in the neighborhood. And so, uh, uh, irrespective of the size, uh, just for the footprint of the buildings in the area, you know which uh, ones have various uh, functions, uh, both literally, literal and symbolic. <coughs> and so the Nichols House becomes one of these very special exceptions uh, within the architecture of the Brookwood Park and Alden Park neighborhoods, and also within Valdosta in general. Uh, this is an exceptional site. Uh, it really forms a kind of pivot on this rather uh, uh, special corner uh, <clears throat> because it's the corner of what became um, two uh, relatively important well-traveled uh, streets. And in the case of a Salian tribe, uh, what, in, in both cases, it was, the, the intersection was going to be approached in both uh, direction. So that made it uh, uh, quite a, a, a difficult design challenge. And there you can kind of see the house uh, as, as Greer and I think Con Thompson. I think they had to collaborate on this design uh, to get it the, uh, the uh, result that you now see. Uh, but you can see uh, in the both elevation and plan uh, uh, the, the office's solution to that difficult and exceptional uh, situation. 
the result is really a kind of villa, uh, a building uh, with four faces and no sides. That's what makes it exceptional. It has no profile. Uh, it becomes, as a result, a modern object in space, but at the same time, because of the way uh, Greer uh, carefully controlled the uh, relationship of the facades of the Nichols House to the lines of the streets, um, at the same time, it was an object integrated into its context. Uh, finally, <coughs> as a result of integration, it reads as a suburban townhouse that participates in a larger whole. There are not terribly many uh, other buildings in Valdosta uh, that uh, approach this modernist ideal of an architecture that tends to the condition of freestanding sculpture. The Nichols House, uh, since it can only be seen in a week, uh, it's really best seen when one is in motion, perhaps driving along one of the adjacent streets. Uh, it exemplifies an ultra-modernism that expresses the fullest confidence in the perpetually changing possibilities of modernity, in which nothing is forever, nothing is certain, everything is always at risk. This is the modern condition that people have been living with since the 15th century, as you know from your art history class. Here beginneth the lesson. <laughs> I can tell if you were ready to go. Where does it go? Um, the Nichols House is a precious gift. And I intended to just let you read what I put on screen because I, I, I wrote it out before you could do this. You want me to read it to you? Do you want to read it? You can read it. Just let me know when you're ready to go. That's their Christmas card from, we think, 1953. A winter scene in Valdosta.
questions, why don't we let the people who want to take off, take off, and those who want to stay for questions.